Thanks, Rina. Uh, so, very nice to be here. Um, a great place. Uh, so, I was kind of trying to think what would be interesting for the uh, for this type of workshop and trying to figure out what are the topics which could be of interest and how to connect a little bit. And there is really nothing very sort of physics about the talk. But I hope, uh, so what I came up with, I think I will give a very brief introduction to kernels in the beginning to the ideas. And then I'll talk about some of our work on kernels and trying to put us in the context of modern machine learning. And I think it is very clear that modern machine learning, well, at this point at least, it is defined by neural networks. So what we're trying to understand is how neural networks, um, what is special about neural networks, what works and what doesn't, and what are some sort of interesting aspects of it. And the goal is to try to understand neural networks sort of without neural networks, or, or may, maybe sort of move even the discussion a little bit um, from trying to uh, understand specifically neural network to trying to understand what kind of aspects of learning we want and how to deal with those aspects of learning. Uh, and uh, so first I will give a brief tutorial on kernels and then I'll uh, uh, describe the work and this, uh, the work I'll describe, which is our work with, um, in collaboration with my students, Si Yuan Ma and Chao Ye Lu, and um, very recently with my uh, colleague, Raev Basili. Uh, so let me start with... Uh, uh, so, first, let me sort of fix a problem. I'm sure everybody is familiar with it, but uh, for completeness, and um, can you please start the time? Yes. Yeah. I don't know, I didn't start. Um, so, what is the problem of supervised learning? You have data, X, I, Y, I. And XIs are point in RD, and you can think of them as, say, images with pixel values. And YI, for simplicity, let's take this as binary classification. So YI is minus one, one, okay, that's the labels. Now, in this talk, I'll only talk about supervised learning, so it's going to be classification. You can think of just having binary classifiers. Now, what's the goal? The goal is to construct a function F from Rd to R, from features to R, such that f of xi in some sense is close to yi, so it outputs the labels correctly, more or less, and this is usually defined by some sort of loss function. And interestingly, we would like f to generalize to unseen data. So in the future, when we get new examples, we would like for those examples to predict their labels. Okay? That's basically supervised machine learning. How is it done? Well, the typical paradigm for that is empirical risk minimization. And it works like that. You propose a class of functions. For example, you propose neural, say, an architecture, neural network architecture. This is what's typically done now. And you try to minimize some loss, L of x i y i. So you can think of this being f of x i minus y i squared, for example, for simplicity. This is a square loss over this class of function. Okay. And this is called empirical risk minimization. And there is a lot of classical theory of that. By the way, there is certainly lots and lots of classical theory uh, based on various generalization analysis, in particular, uh, VC theory, Rademacher complexity, covering numbers, all sorts of things. This is a long line of work. And what is the typical uh, theoretical result that one gets here? It is something like that. With the future performance of my classifier is equal to the, is less or equal to the performance of my classifier on the observed data plus some term which is determined by the complexity. And typically it's of the form square root of C over N when N is the number of data points. Okay, this is a typical generalization bound. I am giving this to sort of set up the um, the background, because in some sense we will see that this is not the kind of generalization bound that really works in modern machine learning. There is something different which is going on. But there is a long line of research which gives you bounds like that. 
And it is certainly helpful to analyze many classical uh, settings of machine learning. Now, let me very, so um, I said here that you propose a class of functions and arguably one of the more beautiful mathematically class of function is something called reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And I'm not sure how familiar people are with it, but you can define this as any Hilbert space of function. So you have some functional space. It's a Hilbert space, so it has a norm and inner product. And suppose that evaluation functional are bounded, meaning that um, f of x is less or equal than norm f in h. There is some constant here, okay? So that's the condition that we need. And that is a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. And this has really beautiful mathematical properties, and it's really good for fitting functions and for doing inference. So how do we get an RKHS? First, well, okay, I said, okay, well, it's some function space with a bound in functional work. Great, that doesn't sound terribly useful, though, because how do we get this? It turns out that um, to get a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, we need what is called a positive definite, or positive, well, let, let's stick to positive definite kernel. And what is a positive definite kernel? It's simply a continuous function from, um, I'll use Z here, but you can just think RD times RD to R. And what is the property? It's symmetric. And it has the funny property that the matrix the kernel matrix, so given x1 dot 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 xn, we can construct the kernel matrix function, which is k x1 x1, and the i j element is k x i x j, right? So yeah, I'm just applying k to all pairs. This is a symmetric matrix because my kernel is symmetric. And suppose this matrix is positive definite, or positive semi-definite, for any choice of x i's. If that is the case, this kernel is called positive definite kernel. And equivalently, there are no negative eigenvalues for this matrix. Now, um, that may be kind of, just from the definition, it's not clear where you get this, but you can um, see that the Gaussian kernels or Laplace kernels, they all have this property. You can prove this using Fourier analysis. Um, so now, why is this nice? Um, this is nice because, well, we have this kind of abstract function space, but now this is actually connected to a specific object, which is this type of kernel. And the good thing about this is these kernels are easily computable from the data. So I am moving from something which is very abstract mathematically to something which is quite concrete. And if you think about, um, say, Sobolev spaces, well, Sobolev spaces are very nice mathematical objects, but to actually compute a norm in a Sobolev space is very difficult. You have to take some sort of derivatives, you have to integrate, how, how do you do this in practice? It's not really possible at high dimensions. This is really it's like a Sobolev space. In fact, you can view it as a generalization of Sobolev spaces. But this is extremely computationally feasible. I just have to be able to compute basically the norm. That's all. So this is, in some sense, a computational instantiation of Sobolev spaces, if you view it that way. Um, now, how do you actually construct? So, Given a positive definite kernel, it's not difficult to actually construct a reproducing kernel Hilbert space. What you do, you take all linear combinations of your kernels and pass to the limit. <laughs> That's basically all there is to it. Uh, so RKHS, you can take the definition to be this. So it's a Hilbert space H with some sort of norm or inner product. I'll just write it as a norm such that f of x is less than c norm f. But this is very abstract, so it's kind of not terribly useful. But this is a rather useful definition, because now I'm just saying, well, I'm taking Gaussian kernel, I'm taking all linear combinations, and I'm passing to the limit, I'm doing completion of that with respect to some norm, and that's how I get it. So much nicer and much more tractable computation. And we will see how it actually goes back to fitting in a second. Uh, 
Okay, so, oh yeah, the important thing is how do you define in a product between kernels? Actually, it's really nice. If I have two kernels, well, I already have it written here, k of x and k of y, right? You can think of them as two Gaussians, one is centered on x and one is centered to y. The inner product is simply k of x, y. And that's, that's what's called the reproducing property. But somehow by taking inner product, you get the kernel back. It reproduces itself. Uh, so, well, linear kernel is the most obvious example of this. You can see that a linear combination of linear kernels, of course, is always a linear function, so it's in some sense trivial. For Gaussian, a linear combination of a Gaussian is not a Gaussian. And, but in some sense, most properties of the kernels are reflected in the properties of the linear kernels. <coughs> Now, uh, the key theorem here is the representer theorem, and uh, this is the following. If um, you have, um, so that's kind of another way to see that why this property actually gives you a reproducing uh, this kernel function. Um, if you have a bounded linear functional, it can be represented as an inner product. This is always true for any Hilbert space uh, and Mer Mercer's uh, theorem. Um, and this actually allows you to define the kernel by something which represents this bounded functional, which is an evaluation. Okay? So let me maybe um, go to the next important property. And here is the following. So what you can see now is, uh, this is some sort of simple computation, is f of x is less or equal than norm f square root of kxx. So just by taking in the product I'm emitting it, it's not super important how exactly, but it's one line. Now, the implication of this is very important because, well, instead of f of x, I can put f of x minus g of x, right? So a difference of two functions is also in the kernel, so this applies to a difference of two functions. So what do I have? I have f of x minus g of x is max of square root of kxx times norm f minus g. Now, uh, this, is, this is nice. Why is this, why is this nice? Because this says that if I have two functions which is close in the norm, then all of the evaluations will be close point-wise. And this is very good because that allows me to tell that my, what, what am I given when I do inference? I'm given this point-wise values of my function. And it's saying that basically, well, if my function is small, then all these pointwise evaluations will also be small. So if two functions are close, then when I evaluate them pointwise, what I'm going to get, I'm going to get similar values. That's why you can do inference. Because imagine now I can have two functions with a small norm of the difference, but these guys could be very large. That means that then from pointwise evaluations, I cannot tell anything about the actual norm of the function. And that means that I wouldn't be able to do any inference. So in some sense, being able to do inference from data and having this reproducing properties are almost the same thing. So, yeah. Uh-huh. So this is for the for, so you can think of this thing being a Gaussian kernel. So this square root of kxx is some constant, or one, let's say. So that's basically saying that f of x minus g of x is less than norm f minus g. So functions which are close in h give predictions which are similar. That's the kind of gist of it. The capital K. Uh, this? No, this is the same. Sorry. Did, did, it, uh, did it come up with a different font? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, this is the same. It's, it's just a font mistake. Yeah. The left and right are the same. It's the same kernel. That's the reproducing kernel property. Yes, exactly. That holds only for the special kernels, for things like a Gaussian, for kernels which have this property, this positive definiteness property. So no, it's not, it's not, it's not a general property. Represent a theorem just says that any bounded functional can be written as an inner product, a linear functional on a Hilbert space. 
And, but in this case, we have this special um, linear functional, which is just an evaluation at a point. And that's clearly a linear functional, and it's bounded by definition of, the, of my space, and so on. Yeah, so I have the C here, which, I mean, this is a little bit more specific than C, because here I don't have any notion of a kernel, but once I define the kernel, I know that the C is square root of k of xx. So we need it to be bounded to have a... So actually, if you look at Sobolev spaces, not all of them are reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. Up to some degree, this can be unbounded, and then the higher order Sobolev spaces will become reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. So, but you can kind of view it as an unbounded kernel. Uh, that sort of, I, I don't want to. Huh? Uh, it will be bounded on a domain, so on, on a cube, let's say. Well, I would say that any inferential procedure, so imagine that I want to have some function space, and suppose I want it to be a Hilbert space. That, of course, is an assumption, because maybe you don't want it to be a Hilbert space. Now then basically you're forced to use something like that because this property is extremely natural, right? Basically it says that predictions, functions which are close in H, have small norm of the difference, must give predictions which are similar because otherwise you cannot differentiate them from your data. If they give widely different predictions, how do I know it's almost the same function? So anything which can be inferred from the data and there's a Hilbert space basically has to be some sort of kernel. There is no, there is no really much room for anything else under the Hilbert space assumption. Of the lake. Yeah. All right, so um, let, let me just briefly talk about practical application, and then I kind of switch gears to, to talk about modern machine learning and how that connects to machine learning as we sort of practice it today or as people practice it today. Um, the um, positive definiteness condition. So I, I cannot show that. I mean, there is some theorem which says, well, there is some properties of derivatives, but it doesn't really help. It's like, uh, what is it? So you can take this to be a definition. So, so you can just define that to be the inner product on Gaussian kernel. So you have e to the minus x minus dot squared in the product e to the minus say, z minus dot, by dot I just mean the argument, squared in h is equal to e to the minus x, this is one dimensional. You can take this to be a definition. Now, of course, you have to prove that this definition gives you a valid in a product that, that requires a little bit of work. There are um, theorems which tell you directly that in a product, that a Gaussian kernel uh, is positive definite, but those theorems are not, you, you know, it's, it's some property of the derivative, but why it's true, I still cannot explain. You have to do some Fourier analysis to basically see that this is true. Um. Okay, so now what are the practical implications? Well, um, so kind of nice theory, so what? Well, okay, that actually gives rise to a rather natural framework, and you can kind of think that, um, well, let's just take F star, now I, I'm going sort of back to my data case, I can just take argmin of F in H, of my loss, right? And I have to put some bound on the norm because if I don't put a bound, I can fit anything using my data. But if the space is infinitely rich, if I use something like a Gaussian kernel, I can fit any data with a Gaussian kernel. And this is equivalent to, um, well, in, in a certain sense, I don't want to explain this right now, to, to the ridge, so this is some sort of ridge regression. Well, if this is a square loss, it's exactly ridge regression, kernel ridge regression. It's sum of the loss, uh, for each data point plus norm f. And here is the cool thing. The cool thing is the following, that you can actually solve this equation explicitly. And the solution is really, really simple. 
First, it's of the form sum alpha i k of x i x, right? This is remarkable because you are taking arg bin of an infinite dimensional space. It's a Hilbert space, it's infinite dimensional. You are minimizing some functional of an infinite dimensional space. And it turns out that this functional actually has a finite form. It's a sum of my kernels centered on data point. So it's like for the Gaussian kernel, this is just a sum of the Gaussians. Moreover, if this is a square loss, so f of l of f of x i, y i is equal to f of x i minus y i squared, then there is an explicit formula for the coefficient. And you, you can see it's just that. It's easy to see. One, once you know this formula, you just plug it in back, and it works out to be matrix inversion. Uh, you, you can do the same thing with the hinge loss and other loss functions. So that, that is pretty remarkable, right? We somehow reduce this infinite dimensional picture to something which is finite dimensional and very, very tractable. Actually, not as tractable as you may think. I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, but certainly much more tractable than doing some infinite dimensional optimization. And finally, um, okay, so that's, oh, why is it? Get stuck. Um, and so, in some sense, you can view it as sort of inverting this kernel matrix, like kernel inference. In practical terms, it's just inverting a matrix, which is very nice because we know a lot about inverting matrices, right? That's a sort of big thing. Uh, now, there is a bunch of theoretical analysis for this. And let me just point out a sort of generalization bound. And the bound is of this form. And maybe I just ignore the approximation bound. It's not super important right now. But uh, generalization bound of this form is the loss of my data minus the kind of loss of the classifier of the future. So this is the classifier f star is what I found. It's arg min of this. My empirical loss minus my sort of, I will call it test loss. So that's kind of a loss on my test data, is less than 1 over square root of n, basically times lambda. There are some other terms, but I'm suppressing it. This, this is the dominant one. Uh, and that's what, how people have thought about this for quite some time. And actually, what I will show you is that it doesn't quite work, unfortunately. Or well, fortunately, I don't know. Depends on your point of view, I suppose. Uh, but uh, so it's a nice result, but it doesn't apply to the stuff that we see. Yeah, yeah this is with probability, I don't know, 0.9, let's say. There, there, there are some terms here which depend on that. I'm suppressing them for, you know, uh, otherwise I have this long thing here and then I have to point out to the to the part of which which matter. So that's why I put it in quotes, the theorem. It's not an actual math theorem, yeah. Uh, this is the empirical measure on actual So that's, I'm thinking that my data is sampled from some probability distribution, the sampling measure, yes. Yeah, so that doesn't really depend very much on the, so you need some sort of Lipschitz conditions on the loss or something. It's, uh, it's rather general. Maybe you need that it's on some domain where it's bounded or something. But uh, yeah, it's not, it's not very specific to quadratic. It's not at all specific to the quadratic loss. Dimension. Yes. Yes. There, there are two. I think there are two takeaways. One, one is that if you want to do inference and you want to use some sort of uh, Hilbert space of functions, you basically have to use this framework. That's one. Two is that this framework is makes inference very, so if I ask you to do something over Sobolev space, you say, okay, well, great, this is a nice mathematical object, but what do I actually do with it, right? But this framework allows you to have this uh, dimension N representation, so it reduces to a finite dimensional optimization very easily. Uh, 
Uh, the function is always a mixture of Gaussian the output, yeah, for, for Gaussian, for Gaussian, but yeah, it's always a mixture of whatever kernels that you use. It will be a mixture of polynomials. Uh, for linear, it's the same, uh, but of course, a mixture of linear is linear, so there is a it's kind of simpler. Okay. Uh huh. Oh, even this thing blows up. I, I'll talk about this later because I think this is all wonderful. And this is, you know, I I used to present it this way. And now I don't believe that. So don't take it too seriously. Well, take, take it seriously. It's mathematical truth. I mean, I mean, sure. But I think what we see is not explained by this type of results. I, and I, I'll tell you exactly what we see. But yeah, it blows up with lambda, and that's a big problem, because that's, that's not what we see, in, for one thing. The width of the Gaussian? So you choose it in some way. In, this, in, in practice, you have some heuristic. It's not something that... Uh, this will work for arbitrary width, but of course the results will vary depending. I mean, if you take it too narrow, it becomes basically one nearest neighbor classifier. If you take it very broad, it's actually very similar to a linear classifier. So you can view the kernels, a Gaussian kernel, as interpolating between linear classifier with very high width to one nearest neighbor with very small width. It's really so. People sometimes think of this as being sort of one nearest neighbor type of classifier. It's not quite correct because on the high end you actually have linear. That's the limit one, so it goes to infinity. Okay. Now let me sort of I'll switch gears and then let me tell you sort of something about machine learning as it stands now and my take on it in from the point of view of kernels. Okay, and yeah, you know, so we have definitely seen machine learning. Everybody is interested in sort of machine learning or AI because it's becoming, well, a backbone in people compared to electricity and uh, um, whether it's justified is a different matter, but it is certainly becoming very important. Um, and how does it work? Well, if you look at um, sort of a modern or relatively modern architecture, of machine learning methods, it looks something like this. This is a Google Net from about three years ago. And this guy, um, you can kind of visually see it's a rather complex object. And it has, um, I think, on the order of between five to 10 million parameters. So not the most tractable thing, uh, but it works and it works well. So on one hand side, we have something which works well. On the other hand side, we have something which is not really tractable and which is hard to think of sort of rigorously about, mathematically or, you know, um, scientifically. Um, so in some sense, there is, you, can, you can call it a sort of fog of war, that the success of neural networks makes it difficult to think about them scientifically. And what we would like to isolate, well, what is new and what is key to that success? And here is sort of what I would like to have. I would like to have a model for modern ML. And what, what do I mean by a model? I mean something which is different from what people do, but something which exhibits many of the same properties. And first, I would like it to be competitive on modern data. I would like it to be analytically tractable. And I would like the inference problems to be convex. And that's analytically tractable and convex, of course, are closely related because convex is usually something which is analytically tractable, not necessarily, but often. Um, and um, what I would like to talk about is, um, I, I would actually like to argue that kernels are already such a model, but we have to understand properties of kernels a little bit differently from what people have understood in the past because of peculiarities of modern machine learning and because some properties, I think, have been overlooked. They have been noticed and then sort of ignored 
because somehow they didn't seem to be important at that point. Things are different now. For kernels it is, if the loss function is convex. Oh yeah, I should point out, and I, that's probably worth going back for that one. That's a really important point. Note that this problem is actually a convex problem on an infinite dimensional space, but moreover, uh, assuming this little l is convex, but uh, all, all sort of usual loss functions are convex. Um, well, not, not all, majority. Um, now, if I plug in this solution, I know that it has this form. I have this finite dimensional problem, that problem is also convex. So it's beautiful, it's a finite dimensional convex optimization problem, so we know everything about it, right? Well, not quite, but it is certainly a very nice problem to have, much better than optimizing over this very uh, complex architecture. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about, I would like to say, well, first, why are kernels not competitive on large data? Then I'll talk about stochastic gradient descent, which I think is key, it's really important. I'll, I, I don't know whether everybody knows about stochastic gradient descent in this, what it, but I'll, I'll tell you what it is and why this is so important. And then I think once this um, computation is addressed, you do see that the kernels have this modern behavior. SGD is extremely efficient. Overfitting, you see exactly the same patterns. And you can also do accelerated methods similarly to what you do with uh, neural networks, and you can prove something about them. But I probably will skip that one. Okay. Um, now, uh, here is the point. So what, first, what is modern machine learning? I think the sort of most important aspects of modern machine learning is that we deal with large data, right? The data is probably millions of data points for many interesting problems. And now it is very systematic. A lot of the success of recent machine learning has really depended on having very large data. Like millions or maybe tens of millions, I think for Google it's even maybe in the billions for some problems. Now, uh, when the data are so large, the computation becomes important, right? And what is computation? Computation is, well, you load something in your computer and you compute, right? But the computer is not a uniform thing anymore because, well, we have GPUs. GPUs are about um, two orders of magnitude faster than the CPU nowadays, more, more than GPU. That's, that's a rough estimate, but it's about right. Um, so you have uh, a special machine, basically, within your machine, which is about 100 times faster. And if your problem doesn't, ma doesn't map into a GPU, you basically are in trouble because 100 times slower means that you're probably not competitive on interesting problems. Now, what does GPU do? You can think of that GPU is very good at taking matrix vector products. It doesn't do very much else, but matrix vector products, or maybe matrix matrix products for kind of skinny matrices. It's, um, it's very good. It's very fast. But you cannot do general purpose computation on a GPU. Uh, GPU, by the way, is a graphics processing unit, if you haven't seen it. But I mean, it's really a matrix vector multiplier. So now that limits the algorithms which you have available. Because, well, what do you have now? Well, you have this machine which does certain things extremely fast. So your computation must map into those operations. And those operations are matrix vector products. So basically, you can kind of think, well, it's great to say that I find F by empirical risk minimization, but what you actually have is only what you can find in your machine, and what you can find in your machine is whatever your GPU allows you to find. So, okay, you, uh, you can do a small number of very large matrix vector products, and that's about it. Maybe some other computations, but much smaller scale. So that's basically your restriction. So that's, I would say, modern machine learning. And all uh, neural network training algorithms map onto that. The gradient descent in particular. Uh, 
Okay, so now kernel, we already went over it. By the way, I should point out that there is, a, you know, really for kernels, there is this really beautiful classical statistical and mathematical theory from, you know, the actual theory of reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces to splines and more recently to, you know, Wapniks like 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I guess now, uh, kernel machines. And they perform very well on small data, what I described to you just a few minutes ago, but not so well on large data. And people have argued that this is intrinsic architectural limitation. And my take on it is that there may be something to do with G, with um, computations and with how it maps, how certain computations map onto, uh, um, onto the compute architectures. And um, it turns out that basically if standard methods practical for large data very much limit what you can find in terms of inference. And once you address this kind of computational reach problem, you get methods which are much faster and much more accurate. Okay, so let me point out the exact problem. Suppose I'm just doing kernel regression, and I, as I said before, this is inverting a matrix, and I'm not using regularization here. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why I'm not using regularization in a little bit. It's actually an important point. If, so this K is a matrix, it's a kernel matrix, and its size is n by n, when n is my data. Now, how um, big it is? Well, it's, uh, say you have one million data points, that's a million by million matrix, and a direct inversion will cost you n cubed. n cubed is a million cubed, right? That's um, 10 to the 21, and that's basically impossible. Okay, so you cannot invert a million by million matrix, and uh, moreover, that doesn't map onto GPU, so you're, you know, you're in big trouble. So that is not going to work. Um, when I say cannot, maybe you can on some supercomputer, but it's certainly not a practical solution for any. And, and t take now 10 million data points, okay, that you cannot invert on any machine. Um, so what's the alternative? Alternative is an iterative method. And this you can um, this has different names. It's known as Richardson Landweber iteration, but this is really just gradient descent. You you can write this. How does it work? I um so I want to find uh uh this alpha star, so I just have this iteration alpha t equals alpha t minus one minus eta times k alpha t minus one minus y, right? So that's just matrix multiplication. That is certainly very feasible because it's only n squared per iteration and it maps beautifully onto your GPU because it's just matrix vector multiplication. That's what GPU does, exactly. So even with 10 million data points, it's no problem. However, oh, and moreover, when you do stochastic gradient descent, this is much cheaper than that. Um, how many iterations do you need? And here you have an issue. And let me point out this issue on a simple example. This is a heaviside function, and you can think of heaviside function as being classification. So this is a positive example, this is a negative example. It's a toy example, but it's sort of real in a sense. It reflects some intuition. Uh, so this is what you get after 100 iterations of gradient descent with a Gaussian kernel of reasonable width. So you can say, okay, this is not too terrible, this is a reasonable fit. But let's see what you get after a million iteration. Well, can you even tell the difference? Like, which is hundred? Which is a better fit? Well, you can kind of see maybe blue is a slightly better fit. But if you actually look at the loss function, you didn't increase by even a factor of two after a million iterations. So that's nothing. Totally stuck. What's going on? Well, why is it frozen after one million iteration? Well, it turns out that uh, this has something to do with eigenvalue decay of the Gaussian kernel, and I'll describe it in a second. But let me point out, this is not just a toy example. You can see on some real data set that you have the same behavior. This is 10,000, two data sets with 10,000 points. You can ignore the exact numbers, but basically you need uh, more than 10,000 iterations of your gradient descent, so the complexity will become worse than cubic. So it's useless, right? If your complexity is worse than cubic, you would never use an uh, uh, iterative method. You don't get any benefit. Okay, so what's going on there? And uh, basically, um, this may be 
is a little dense, but let me point something out. This is your kind of theorem you can prove. You can prove, uh, so lo look at theorem two. You can, the, I, I don't want to define what fat shattering dimension is and uh, all the things, but that is some notion of complexity of the space of functions which you can reach. And the complexity of the space of function that you can reach scales logarithmically, or polylogarithmically to be precise, in the number of iterations of a gradient descent. So that means that basically after t iterations of gradient descent, you only have log t complexity, and that's very bad because if my function is not in this very restricted set of things which I can reach, you will need the potentially exponential number of iterations. That's what we see. And um, this is related to eigenvalue decay, and you can kind of see that in practice the eigenvalue decay is actually uh, consistent with that. Um, now, uh, here is something which is even worse. If you think about what you can reach using something like a Gaussian kernel, you can see that if your function is very smooth, if your target function is very smooth, it's okay, you can reach it without too many iterations. But if my function is not very smooth, say it's not infinitely differentiable, I cannot reach such a function in the polynomially many iterations of my kernels. That's very bad, right? So heavy side function, of course, is not smooth, it has a discontinuity, so that's why I have I need that exponentially. That's why after one million iteration, nothing happens, because that's exponentiality coming in. That is very problematic. And you don't expect classification problems to be very smooth because you think, okay, I have two classes, I have some boundary between these two classes, and I have some sort of pretty quick drop-off between the boundaries, right? These are cats, these are dogs, and there are some, a few examples between cats and dogs, but there's fairly sharp cutoff between, between cats and dogs. Um, okay. Why is this a problem? Oh, let me actually explain what exactly is happening here. It's not too hard to see. What is happening is the following, is that if uh, you look at eigenvectors of my matrix, so E1, EN, and so on, with eigenvectors, and they have the corresponding eigenvalues. And you can see that what is happening is that the error you get in the direction of the i's eigenvector is something like this. So this is the number of iterations of gradient descent, this is the i's eigenvalue, and this is the kind of error that you get, and you want this to be close to zero. But this, of course, is not very close to zero. When lambda i is very small, you need something like one over lambda i iterations to get one bit of precision, one over e, right, because one this to the one over lambda i is equal to one over e. So to one over e is kind of like one bit. So to get one bit, you need one over lambda i. These guys are decaying exponentially. So to get some reasonable fit, say if you have 100 components and you have exponential decay, you have like e to the, this would be like e to the minus 100. So you need e to the 100 iterations to get one bit of precision, and that, of course, is impossible computationally. So you're hitting this limit of computation because of the eigen decay. Uh, yeah. Um, this is approximation in a L2 norm, but uh, you, you, I, I think you would get the same thing in L infinity, yeah. Um, by the way, uh, if you... Uh, are familiar with the classical analysis of gradient descent. This seems to contradict the classical analysis of gradient descent because that says that you get one over epsilon squared rate for GD. Uh, actually, it doesn't contradict it because of some sort of infinite dimensionality issue here. But uh, let me not go into that since this is probably not common background here. But um, some people may notice that it on the face of it contradicts to some classical results. Well, it doesn't. Okay, now le let me point out a solution and then I'll talk about something uh, related to this. How would you solve it? Well, if the problem is quick decay of eigenvalues, maybe you can uh, compensate it by making it slower. And how do you make it slower? Well, this is the spectral theorem for the kernel, so this is infinite dimensional version of the usual spectral theorem. Um, 
And uh, basically, it says that k of x z can be written as some lambda i e i of x e i of z, where these guys are eigen functions of k. Um, and what do you do? You basically say, okay, well, let me just modify this decay. So initially, I have some sort of constant decay. So I modify the first so many eigenvalues, first k eigenvalues of this. You can kind of graphically think of it this way. These are my eigenvalues, and they decay. They go to zero. It's a compact operator, so they go to zero. Let me change them. So I'll have this. Now, if I have that, you can see that the kernel with this eigenvalue decay. So it's the same eigenvector, so eigenfunctions, but different eigenvalues. Now, this will fit the first k eigendirection in just one iteration. And for every direction after that, you get an acceleration which is equal to lambda i over lambda k plus 1. Uh, so that's kind of, that's what we call eigenprozess idea, but I'll, I'll tell you a little bit oops, about how to actually do it. Um, so if you think about this, this is kind of what um, gradient descent gives you after t iteration. And this is what you get with this uh, modified kernel after t iteration. And you can see that the fat shattering dimension here is log d. Here, it is log d also, but there is some exponential constant now in front of it. So you didn't change the fact that it's polylogarithmic, but you added an exponential constant. And of course, constants are important. Well, exponentially, large constants in particular are important. Okay. So you can kind of view it as exponentially increased reach per step, but what is the extra computational cost, right? I didn't tell you about the cost of it because maybe computing the thing will actually cost you all the advantage that the kernel has. And here is the nice thing. Uh, the nice thing is I'm, maybe I'll just go over quickly because I'm happy to explain this offline in more detail if anybody's interested, but basically you can implement this as some sort of preconditioned gradient descent. And the nice thing is that <clears throat> the preconditioner, this extra P matrix, can be computed very cheaply from a small subset of the data. So you compute this P, and so doing what I just said for the whole matrix would require a full eigen decomposition of the matrix. That's very expensive. That will negate any advantage. But you can do it on a small sum sample, then do some sort of out of sample Nystrom extension or uh, RSVD. And you can use that, and that's an approximate version of what I said, and that actually works very well. So here is a nice thing. There is a low initial cost because P is estimated from a soft, small subsample, so I'm not losing very much in that. And there is a low overhead per iteration because somehow this is a low rank matrix. So in practice, it's something like 15% or 20% at most. Um, and the good thing is that this is robust even if I estimated P because it's only a proper approximation. Even if I didn't approximate it exactly, you still converge to the same thing. Uh, okay, let me skip it. Let me just show you some experimental result with this. Um, this is basically results in some standard data sets, and you can see that the acceleration factor is about between 6 and 35 times. So you can kind of get a method which is about 20 times as fast, realistically. Something like that, 15 maybe, I don't know, on average. Uh, what does it translate it? It translates into the following, so this is some data set, so in particular this is timid, it's some speech data set, doesn't really matter what it is, it's identifying phonemes in uh, in uh, a corpus of uh, sounds. And um, what we see is that we get a result with four hours on a GPU, on a single GPU, we get a result which is pretty much better than everything in the literature. And some of those results use supercomputers, or actually all of them use some fairly heavy computational resources, like, you know, seven hours and 1,000 vCPU, well, Amazon CPUs. Um, and, um, there is one result which is better, but that's, in fact, this is using some sort of modified kernel, but it's, uh, they're using some learned features, so it's not exactly comparable. But this is the nice thing. This is a kind of out-of-the-box Gaussian kernel. There is nothing really special going on here. We don't do any feature engineering or any, anything special aside from this precondition. Um, 
Here is, by the way, the result for a neural network, and this is a fully connected neural network. And you can see, th this was also trained using some fairly heavy computational resources, because it's a two million data points, right? It's not that small. Uh, and, you know, we beat it fairly easily using standard kernel methods. So overall, what you can say, the other data sets are kind of the same. You basically get the same or better performance using much, much less computation. So my take on this is that I think we are pretty much can beat or at least very competitive as fully connected neural network. Uh, and if you have a problem where you're using fully connected neural networks, there is no reason to use this first. You probably will get as good or better result with much less computation. Okay, so that's... Um, that's that. Um, now let me uh, switch. Yeah. That's um, very good. In fact, I, I hit something here. We are using stochastic gradient descent. This is very important. But let me get, I'll get back to stochastic gradient descent. It's actually super important to use stochastic gradient descent rather than gradient descent. Yeah. Uh, this one we're just doing uniform. We, we, so we're not using, so we probably can, uh, for, for P, right, for computing that precondition. We're actually doing, uh, so we've tried a couple of different things. It seems that just taking a subsample uniformly and using either Nystrom or RSVD give very similar results. And maybe that using some sort of leverage scores you could get better, you know, sort of. Uh, we should play with it a little more to see. But right now we're using very basic. Um, okay, so le let me uh, sort of switch, well, switch a little bit to back to modern ML. So I, I hope I showed that at the very least using kernels in some slightly computationally more efficient way, you actually get quite a lot of mileage out of it. And you, in fact, can make them competitive to methods such as fully connected. I, I emphasize fully connected because there is something special going on with convolutional neural networks which are used for images, and I think that requires a separate analysis. But um, now let me point something very interesting about modern machine learning, and I'll, I'll sort of cycle back to kernels in a little bit. And what is um, one innovation of modern machine learning? So I said one thing was, okay, data is very important, large data, it has to map to a GPU, that's very clear. But there is a real innovation about uh, deep learning, I feel. And this innovation, is, you know, it may sound a little bit funny because I would say this is systematic overfitting. And why does it sound funny? Because, well, you know, if uh, I, I was told when I was a graduate student not to do it. It's a bad thing, right? I, overfitting is bad. But let's look at this. This is a picture from the Gonziani et al. This is a summary of architectures of neural networks, of a bunch of modern neural networks. The size of the circle is actually the number of parameters. And you can see the small circles is about 5 million parameters. The large circle is about 150 million parameters. So you have a 150 million parametric model, which you are training in some cases on, you know, like 50 or 100,000 examples, like uh, some of those. Like MNIST, when, when you train something like that on MNIST, MNIST has 60,000 examples, it's a handwritten digits. You are training 150 million parameters. So the number of parameters is something like two, three orders of magnitude more than the number of data, right? That's crazy. This is um, extreme over-parameterization for many of these cases. Um, in fact, if you look at the Ruslan Salakdinov gave a very nice Simons tutorial on deep uh, learning, and he said, well, th this is actually a quote. Uh, the best way to solve the problem is that you build a very big system, if you remove any of this regularization, you want to make sure you hit zero training error. Okay? You want to hit zero training error. And now, if you think about what does over-parameterization give you? 
when you have over parameterization, that means that you basically um, have many more directions to go down that you have data. So you can kind of think of data points as being constrained and um, your parameters as being some sort of directions. So you have many more directions and constraints, so you should be able to hit zero training error, right, when you over parameterize like that. And if you think what zero training error means, so for classification it's not so clear, but if you think about it in terms of regression, and when you train it, you don't actually use classification loss for training, you use some sort of continuous loss for training, like square loss or logistic loss. That means that you interpolate your data. So f of xi is actually equal to yi. Well, it cannot be equal because of numerics, but it's close. And uh, in these cases, you can show that all local minima are global and many special examples. There are actually quite a few theoretical uh, results on this. But as I said, it's not too surprising because you have so many more parameters and data points. Now, so why do I say this is an innovation? Because nobody has done it before in the systematic way and people have always thought that it was crazy. And the neural network people actually went ahead and did it and it works. Uh, so, okay, now you can ask two questions here, and there are two sort of obvious questions in some sense. First, why are large models with so many parameters easy to optimize? And second, why do large models perform well? So I will give you some answer to the first one, but um, I don't know about the second one. So let me first, I'll, I'll discuss this in a second. So first, very large models lead to over parameterization. That's clear. That leads to over in, to interpolation. And it turns out that we actually show that SGD is extremely efficient in this interpolated regimes. Now, the second question is, well, why do large models perform well? And that seems to contradict classical generalization. There is a recent nice paper by uh, Jean et al. on rethinking generalization. That's actually a table from there. You can see that the training accuracy is consistently 100%. And test accuracy is good, whatever it is. And if you remember this kind of classical generalization bound, this is very difficult to explain from that point of view. I think it's impossible to explain. I think there is something going on there which is just not explainable by this. C is kind of the now it's a dimension, some, some notion of dimension, like Rademacher complexity, VC dimension, some, some notion like that. But you see, this is zero, right? So you're, this loss is zero. Now you're trying to bind something which is non-zero by something which is zero plus something. How can you even possibly get anything tied with that when your, your, your cap doesn't go to zero? But let, let me get back to this because I think this is a really important point. I actually have some slides about that. So I don't think we know why. I, I'm pretty sure margins is not the whole story. Margin, I think, explain one aspect of it, but not not those. And um, but the nice thing we will show the same thing for kernels. It's not there is nothing deep about this. I mean, it's not specific to deep architectures. Okay, let me talk about now stochastic gradient descent. Why this is so important. Uh, first, what is stochastic gradient descent? Well, remember that we basically try to optimize. A function like that, and this function is the sum of loss function for every data point. If you kind of think you have f of xi minus y, you can take each one of them as a little loss function. And we try to compute, if we do gradient descent, we compute the gradient of the sum. But what if we don't do the sum? What we just do it one at a time? That's basically stochastic gradient descent. Okay, so we optimize these guys one at a time. Or in practice, it's not done one at a time. You take a mini batch and you just optimize them some hundred at a time. Uh, and you do it sequentially. Well, to get analysis, you do it at random, but in practice, nobody does it at random. Uh, here is the problem. The problem is that each one of those guys only weakly relates to the total loss because you can increase you can decrease one of those losses, but you can make the total loss worse, right? Because you, you keep changing your parameters. Um, that uh, makes analysis rather difficult. And in, moreover, what you can see is that, in general, what is going to happen 
is that you're going to reach somewhere like around the minimum, and then you're just going to oscillate because you increase one, you make the other worse, and you increase, uh, you decrease the next one, you make the rest of them worse, and so on. So you'll just go back and forth, back and forth. Um, therefore, you cannot actually get a good rate until you do some sort of adaptive step size, and then you have to play with it and so on. It's complicated. There is analysis of that, but it's complicated. And the rate you get is not very good. You can get some sort of exponential rate, but it's uh, difficult, requires adaptive step sizes. But here is the interesting thing. If it's supposed now we're in the interpolated regime. In the interpolated regime, remember, in the W star, each one of those guys is equal to zero because f of xi is equal to yi. If we're in that regime, it turns out that um, you actually get exponential convergence of stochastic gradient descent, not gradient descent itself. And that was, in fact, observed. That was observed before. I think the first paper was... Um, for the quadratic case, actually, there is much older paper by Katzmart, but in general case, Moulin and Bach seem to be the first to observe it. Um, and... When you have this observation, well, so you, if you combine this with the fact that you're doing interpolation, then you see that in the overparameterized regime, SGD actually gives you exponential convergence. This is not enough, however, notice. I said exponential convergence, I didn't say how fast it is, and we thought before that these kernels, for example, converge exponentially, but extremely slowly, because this lambda can be very, very slow, right? And then exponential convergence doesn't give you very far. So what you need to compare is gradient descent with stochastic gradient descent. So what you want is to say that stochastic gradient descent is almost as good as gradient descent itself. You cannot get it from those general bounds directly. Now, in practice, nobody ever uses full gradient descent. I, I don't know of anybody who uses it. Maybe somebody does, but it's, um, it's just not used. Why people don't use it? Well, because it's not computationally efficient. Let me tell you why. So consider now a quadratic case. So suppose my loss function is quadratic, or I'm close to a minimum where I can approximate everything with a quadratic function. And here is the interesting thing. This is what we showed, actually. Um, you can show that if you take mini batch of size 1, this is computationally optimal. So mini batch of size 1 is best mini batch size for any M. Best computationally per unit of computation. Now, um, the second thing is the following, is that you have uh, really two regimes if you change your mini-batch size. So mini-batch size is how many of those guys you're optimizing all at once. You, can some, you have something which you can call linear regime, and then you, can, you have something which you can call saturation. And in linear regime, so mini-batch of size 1 is optimal, but mini-batch of size 2 is only very, very slightly less efficient computationally. So one and two are almost the same, and three and, you know, one and three is almost the same. So basically, mini batch of size three takes three times as much computation as mini batch of size one, but it gives you almost three times as much um, improvement. And this goes up like that to something which is uh, like one of a lambda one of H, where H is a hash shell. And at that point, you get saturation. And beyond that, no matter how big your mini batch is, you get some small factor, which is actually a four. It's, the fact is four. You can get no more than four times improvement. And in practice, when you compute this, when you compute this for kernels, this is one of a lambda one of h. For kernels, it's something like five. So your mini batch of size five is effectively as good as your full gradient descent. Now, how many more computations does it take? So gradient descent, say you have one million of data points. Gradient descent gives you 10 to the 6, right? You need 10 to the 6 uh, computation over mini batch of size 1, because full gradient descent is a mini batch of size full data size, so that's 10 to the 6. Now, mini batch of size 1 is 5. So you have computational improvement, which is 10 to the 6. Well, let's, let's make it 10. So this is mini batch of size 10. This is mini batch of size 10 to the 6. Now, you have 10 
to the five computational improvement of many batch of size 10 of uh, full gradient descent, and you get the same result. So you get um, five orders of magnitude faster. So if you didn't have this, so I believe this is why a modern machine learning actually works. If you didn't have this, you would not be able to compute those things. If you actually had to compute full gradient descent, if you didn't have this over-parameterization magic, you would never be able to get a good result with current computational resources because five orders of magnitude is impossible. That's more than the GPU. GPU maybe gives you two orders of magnitude, and the Moore's law maybe over like last 10 years gives you three orders of magnitude. This is more than that. So somehow this over-parameterization is magical because we don't know why it works, but the fact is when the number of when you're you are converging to an interpolated minimum, you have this incredible computational efficiency. And the interesting thing, this is very consistent with what people actually found in neural networks. So this, of course, we are assuming that we are locally at the minimum. So that's because the quadratic approximation needs to work. So you cannot say directly that neural network, we, in a neural network, we don't know how far we are from the minimum. But what people do, they actually do some sort of pre-warming or warming. They use some sort of larger step size. When they get the error down, they increase the step size of their gradient descent. And they found that this works very well. And in fact, the size that they take is larger than what theory would suggest. And it's larger because they're probably close now to an interpolated minimum. So that's, um, that's, uh, that's basically what happens. Now, you, you can do this computation and you see that basically if you use a uh, number of iterations with full gradient descent, well, this is a small subset with 10,000 data points, you basically get the same error as uh, if you take a mini batch of size uh, 16, I think, in this case. This is for kernel. Um, okay, so that... For kernels, we know them very well. For, um, so for neural networks, we can kind of compute them, but it's kind of a little bit of black art because we don't actually know how to, how to do this. For, for kernels, of course, we just take a small subset of this compute. It's very accurate. So we just need to know tr trace, of course, it's trivial, but lambda 1 is um, easy to compute. So we, we can, for kernels, we can compute all the things very precisely. So we're looking now whether we can accelerate neural networks with the same thing. It, it seems that we can, but uh, sort of. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't need overparameterized as such. I just need that at the minimum, all my losses function is zero. That is very important, yes. And that follows kind of, well, so mathematically overparameterized doesn't have to have that property, but you sort of expect from, a, when your number of parameters is larger than the number of variables, you expect that there are many solutions which lost zero. But you cannot have less than zero because of it's a positive function. So this has to be, uh, so this is either for a quadratic case or when you're close to zero and your Taylor series, the quadratic term is dominant. So you need to be close to zero. So the kind of hypothesis here is that in neural networks, when they do this warming, pre-warming or this initial kind of regime, they actually do some sort of search to find something which is close to zero. And then they turn on this machinery. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll get to that in a second. Yeah. So that, that, that's the question. So there, there, is, there is some sort of magic, clearly, because we don't know why this over-parameterization works. So for kernels are always over-parameterized. Well, they're not over-parameterized. They're fully over-parameterized because the number of parameters is equal to the number of data, set, data points. So we know that there is a solution with loss zero. That's all we need. Uh, for neural networks, it's a little harder to know, but we believe that, and there are some theoretical result indicating that this should be the case for certain classes of networks. Um, but, but why? Yeah, so let me now kind of point out that overfitting. And le let me say that we can overfit with kernel just as well as with neural networks. So what is this? Um, this is 
number of epochs, so we're just training our kernel. And we're, this is like in Pro, so we're using our accelerated method. And basically, the more you train, the lower your L2 loss becomes on the train set, right? Because I'm basically solving this equation, I'm solving it better and better. So you can see that after 320 epochs, you have something like 3 to 10 to the minus 5. So it's pretty close to a numerical solution. Maybe like actual numerical matrix inversion would be 10 to the minus 7 or something. I'm almost getting matrix inversion here. And here is an interesting thing. So you can see classification just keeps going. To, well, it, it goes to zero and it stays at zero. Regression loss keeps going down. And, but let's now look at the test. It goes to about 1.23 after 10 epochs, and it just stays the same. It doesn't change. This is extremely counterintuitive because you think this is really bad overfitting, right? I'm really like interpolating my data. This should go up, but it doesn't go up. It never goes up. It's stable. I don't have any lambda. I have lambda is equal to zero. I'm just saying that um, I have x, i, y, i. There exists a linear combination sum alpha i. So my f of x is sum alpha i k of x i dot such that, well, x, such that f of x i is equal to y. Uh, it's just solving a system of linear equations. So you can see that alpha is just k to the minus 1 uh, y, when y is a labels. And this is a positive definite matrix because it's a positive definite kernel. So positive definite matrix is non-degenerate. I can invert it, at least in theory. In practice, of course, inverting a matrix is hard. But in theory, I know the solution always exists. So I may not be able to find the actual solution, but I should be able to get close to it. So I, I'm in this regime when I'm close to the solution. Um, so this, this is really quite remarkable. And you know, people have observed it before, I think, but sort of maybe didn't pay attention. I mean, there is some sort of much older results like that from boosting when people observed that. And there were some explanations, but I don't think any explanations can actually be true. And let me point out, uh, true in this regime. The, the, let me point out something interesting. So this is Pegasus is just gradient descent. And if you use, and this is much slower, of course. So you can see that, um, you know, to get to 1.23, you need 320 iterations. Here you need 10 iterations. So it's about 20, uh, sorry, 30 times slower than this accelerated method. But look at this. You see that this is this is gradient descent. This is classification error, and this is uh, on train, and this is classification error on test. If I just have say five epochs of ordinary gradient descent, this is 0.236. This is 0.2.84. This is very good generalization. This is 0.36 and 0.2.84, very close together. So you can see that the bounds actually work in this regime. And five epochs of gradient descent is when my complexity is kind of low of my function space because I haven't yet fit the data very much there. But once I go down here, my complexity is much higher. My classification error becomes zero. But my regression error is also, uh, my, uh, my test error is also better. So it seems that classical generalization bound work in this regime when my complexity, function class complexity is still low, but the performance is actually suboptimal. So here I have 2.8, here I have 1.2. 1.2 is very good, right? It's MNIST. Actually, this is very good because an MNIST 1.2, if you train fully connected neural network, you get something 1.5. This is better than fully connected neural network. Uh, and this is out of the box Gaussian curve. Uh huh. Amnista handwritten dim, images of handwritten digits. It's, uh, they're pictures of digits. Things like this. And we're just doing pixel wise, so it's, it's really simple. We're not using, to, this will not work very well in this, these features don't work very well on more complicated images. 
for those you have to use the sort of convolutional things. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is close to optimal width. You, you have to play a little bit with the width. Yeah, you can do it on some sort of subset. And uh, yeah, you have to play a little bit with the width, but it's not too difficult to find something which is reasonable. Uh, so what you do, you usually try a few and you find. Uh, you have some idea because of the distance between all the points, what it should be, and then you, you try a few and you choose the best. It's comparable to the distance between nearest neighbors, but maybe you need a little bit larger or something. Yeah, it's... Uh, Oh, it's much better than nearest neighbors. Nearest neighbors in this case is, I believe, um, two point something percent. So it's twice as good. It, it's always better. It's always better than nearest neighbors. Um, yeah. So you can kind of see this interpolation. You, you are in this interpolation regime and your error is very small but you actually are performing extremely well. I don't think any theory that we have can explain this because you see the complexity here is actually very high of the 300 iterations. You fit your data exactly, you fit your data exactly both in classification and regression, but you don't pay any price in terms of the test. There is no U kind of shape. Uh, but one point I would like to make is why standard methods people maybe have not observed it as much using the standard method is because standard methods just converge much slower, so you have to, you know, this, this takes a long time on, a, you know, even five years, this is on the GPU, it's relatively quickly. Now we're using a modern GPU, this takes a few minutes maybe. Five years ago, this 320 iteration of uh, gradient descent would take a long time. So people were just not patient enough, it's a kind of regularization by patience, that you just get tired of running the thing. And, you know, things go down very slowly. So I think acceleration make a big difference because it just makes the regimes more accessible to us. Yeah. People have tried that. Yeah, so, oh, um, I should make this point. So stochastic gradient descent is very easy to distribute because you can compute it for each of the points separately. However, think about this. This is linear regime. This is where this is efficient to distribute. If you distribute it in the saturation regime, you don't get anything. So this actually shows that distributed computation of gradient descent is not efficient in beyond something like 1 over lambda 1. It doesn't matter, even if you have infinite amount of computational power to distribute it, you only get a factor of four improvement. It's negligible. Yeah, so you can you can you can do it in different ways. You can split the matrix and you can do it, but then you, you also have overhead. So you, you can probably scale this, but you are paying very heavy overhead communication costs, right? When you actually want to do it. So what it makes sense, it basically makes sense to distribute SGD up to this level and probably doesn't make sense to distribute it beyond that. If you have a truly gigantic problem, then you probably have to distribute it in any case. But uh, you have to, I don't know, the, the, there have been quite a lot of work on this, but how, how do you trade off communication costs? It's a highly non-trivial thing. But certainly just distributing SGD doesn't give you anything beyond. You, you should not distribute beyond this point because you would be wasting your efforts. Um, yeah. So this is overfitting. And uh, this is the same thing, but for Timid, which is a much larger data set. This is one million points from Timid. And you can see that with Gaussian kernel, uh, you get something which is L2 losses 10 to the minus 4. Again, it's quite small and the performance is optimal. So you are basically interpolating here. Interestingly enough, with a Laplace kernel, which is very similar to Gaussian, but it's e to the minus norm x minus z without a square, um, divided by something like sigma. Um, 
you actually um, have much better interpolation and it's almost the same result. It's basically the same result. So, okay, why do overfitted models perform so well? Well, we don't actually know why. But there are implications in terms of computation, and those implications are very important. I believe they're extremely important. Um, however, clearly this is not a unique feature of deep architectures. So if you have some solution for deep architectures of why this is true, well, that better explain also what kernels do. So there cannot be a solution for neural networks which doesn't explain what kernels do. And now we can certainly examine this in a convex analytical setting of the kernels and try to understand what is happening. And sort of my personal conjecture is that the kernels and neural networks are doing some sort of nearest neighbor, but not one nearest neighbor. One nearest neighbor is not very good. And it's doing, it's not even like something like three nearest neighbors because three nearest neighbors don't interpolate. But they're doing some sort of local fitting. And you can kind of think that you may be fitting some sort of piecewise linear function to it. You can analyze this type of classifier. We don't actually know that this is what is happening. But if you could somehow, so let me give you some sort of intuition on this. If you, uh huh? That I call over-parameterization. When I talk about overfitting, by that I mean that the loss is almost zero. Zero or almost zero. So f of f of xi, let's say f of xi equals to yi. Approximately equals to yi. That I call overfitting. Because that's bad, because that's... that's um, most analysis would say that you shouldn't do this because you're fitting noise. But it seems that it's okay. You are fitting noise. Clearly, those data sets are noisy. There is noise in them. You are fitting the noise. It's still okay. The performance is still okay. I quantify it by using the regression loss, right? F of xi minus yi squared. Something like this. You know, if, if this is like 10 to the minus 5, you know you're pretty close to being like numerically zero. I have two classes, and say I have some label noise, right? So I would be fitting something like this. You know, I have some label noise here, right? I mean, yeah, I agree that in high dimension it's less obvious. I mean, we actually see that it's not bad, but all classical analysis would suggest that this is bad because you have some sort of penalty which increases as you overfit the data. But usually you want your loss on the training set and loss on the test set to be close together, but in this case they're clearly not close together. So in that case, you know, you have loss on the training set is 1%, and loss on the test set is 30%, right? It's pretty far off. Here you actually get 0% and 30%. So it's um, they're quite far. And I, I don't think there is any real... The only analysis like that is for analysis for one nearest neighbor. That's why I think that this is something like one nearest neighbor. And in fact, you can show that if you have... If you, if you do some sort of local triangulation, which is... You, you can do locally linear fitting, basically. You can triangulate your data and fit locally linear functions to that. And that's not a practical algorithm because triangulated your data in high dimension is very expensive. It's exponentially in dimension, so it's, um, it will kill you if you actually try to do it. But suppose you could, then you see it would actually have some property like that, that you overfit, but somehow the price is very small in high dimension for, fitting that, for overfitting. So probably these kernels are doing that. Probably neural net. Well, that's even more conjectural. But neural networks seem to be doing that. Um, so maybe there is not really any magic to this. In a sense, it's just a very um, somehow they found this very good way to overfit uh, the data using a lot of parameters. They figured out that when you have many parameters, you overfit the data, and for some reason you don't pay a high price. Not clear why not. For kernels, actually, there are some arguments why not, but 
for neural networks are sort of, yeah, so rare. Correct. Uh, well, every point is a support vector for us because we're just using the square laws in all of those experiments. But even when you do the hinge laws, they still there are like a very large fraction of them are support vectors. So it's like thirty percent of them. It doesn't make a big difference in that sense. Um, yeah, but for us, it's actually literally every every vector is a support vector. Uh, You can fit, um, so with the Gaussian kernel, it's kind of difficult to fit a linear. Well, you can, yeah. I, I don't know how many, yeah, I don't know. I don't know any bound on that. I mean, certainly you, if you use a very wide Gaussian, it's pretty easy to fit linears. But you probably, in practice, we use some sort of more narrow Gaussians. Uh, by the way, I would like to point out maybe um, um, some of you maybe have seen the paper um, on rethinking generalization. And there is an interesting point made there that you can fit random data. So you, here is what you do. You take your original data set, but you randomize your labels. So labels have no meaning. They're completely random. And in fact, you can fit that using a neural network, ReLU networks in that case. And you need roughly three times the amount of computation that you have to fit original data. And if you use this with a Gaussian kernel, you see that it's actually very difficult to fit random data because of some of the bounds I had earlier. You need something like 100 times the amount of computation. But if you use Laplace kernel, you actually also did between three and four times. It's very similar to real network. So my sort of feeling is that random, uh, that uh, Laplace kernels and real networks are actually doing something quite closely related. So maybe Railway Network just implements Laplace kernels. I, I'm just throwing this as a conjecture, but certainly many properties are similar. And if you think about the shape of those things, they're also quite similar. Okay. So now let me, I am out of time, but let me just say one word about acceleration. This is something which is used very widely and not completely clear how it works for neural networks because analysis, again, is complicated. And for non-convex optimization, I think there is basically no analysis for this momentum method. What is momentum method? You basically have something like this. You add your gradient from the previous step. However, for kernels, you can understand this, and in fact, you can analyze it, and you can prove that it works. And in fact, um, we've done some recent analysis, uh, it's related to the things called, uh, there is something called Richardson second order method. It relates basically to some classical methods in, um, in um, solving systems of linear equations. And there is something called the Chebyshev semi iterative method. It basically relates to properties of certain polynomials. You can analyze them and you can show that for kernels, you also get provable acceleration, at least without stochastic gradient descent. With stochastic gradient descent, it's a different issue, and we don't yet have an analysis of it. That's actually really important because without stochastic gradient descent, it's sort of practically useless. You can use it with gradient, with stochastic gradient descent, it works, but we don't have a good analysis of that. Um, and there are some interesting aspects for kernels because kernels have infinite condition numbers. Well, they're not actually infinite, but they're extremely large, and the condition number go to infinity as you get more and more data. And if you look at all the existing analysis, they usually have something in terms of the condition number. And accelerated method has a square root of the condition number versus condition number for the original method, but it kind of becomes meaningless when it's infinite. So you have to have some more um, precise analysis in some sense. For kernels, you can do it because it's a linear system. So instead of taking condition number, you take a sequence of condition number for each direction, and you can use some sort of classical uh, uh, polynomials, like Chebyshev polynomials, to understand that. But, okay. Let me um, maybe conclude. Uh, since um, I'm first time out of time and sort of discussing the acceleration in more detail would take too much time. Um, so here is some sort of um, 
thoughts. I think first classical kernel methods serve as a convex model for modern ML. I think they do, and they basically satisfy all those desiderata which I outlined in the beginning. Once computation is addressed, you have the competitive performance and this sort of modern behavior that they overfit and it's okay and the SGD is effective and so on. Uh, one question which is interesting, can we design kernels for parallel computation? And the second thing is that SGD is extremely effective for over-parameterized methods. I think there has been some sort of happy confluence of events for neural networks so that they tried this over-parameterized method. Actually, they tried it even before, even like 20 years ago, there were some. Um, but they sort of very systematically tried it recently, and they really realized it worked. And it turned out that um, it, the performance was very good. If you didn't have that SGD was effective for our parameterized method, you would probably have the four or five orders of magnitude at slower performance with gradient descent versus stochastic gradient. If stochastic gradient descent had the same performance as gradient descent computationally, there would be no modern machine learning. Uh, we don't know why over parameterized methods generalize. I think we really need to understand it. That's, to my mind, this is a key issue. And maybe I'm sort of trying to connect this to the theme. I mean, this has been very different from the theme of the um, workshop, uh, from the physics side of the workshop. But I think maybe physics can help with that because physics can produce maybe some intuition or some ideas of why this over parameterized method. Maybe you take the limit of parameters to infinity or maybe, you know, they, they probably statistical physics can potentially shed some light on this. I, I hope at least. Um, and uh, finally, I would like to point out that we do need to worry about infinite condition numbers. Um, e at least, you know, from the algorithmic point of view, if you actually take, um, if you just take some data, compute the matrix and, you know, covariance matrix of some data, doesn't really matter what it is as long as, you know, like some reasonably high, in say 50 dimension. You have 100 point in 50 dimension, compute its eigenvalues. A lot of these eigenvalues will be very small. So even if you don't have actually infinite condition numbers, you probably have very large condition numbers and those things, um, can be really problematic for a lot of the algorithms that we have, at least from the analysis point of view. Okay, I think I'll stop here and thank you. Uh-huh. Then see how it does on a test set. So, I think this will not going to this will not work. And uh, le let me maybe let me give you an intuition why on a line why I think high dimension matters. <laughs> I, I sort of mentioned this briefly. I, this is a very good idea to do an experiment like that. But I think in dimension one, what you will see is something like this. So imagine I have some. So imagine I have my heavy side function, but with some noise. So my data would be something like this. So this is kind of the plus class. Okay, this is my data. So this is a kind of noisy point. Some of them flip side. And here I have minus, 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 and I have some plus points, right? So most of the points here have a plus one, but some of them are flipped. Most of here are minus one, some of them are flipped. What you will see, you will see something like this. So if you just fit a polynomial, who knows, because you can get crazy stuff. But if you do something more reasonable, some sort of like a kernel, I, I don't want to say this is what you get with the kernel because I don't know. But a more reasonable classifier would be something like this. And you can see this is not too bad, but this is not great. This is some sort of piecewise linear interpolation. It's a and why? Because some fixed proportion of these points will flip sign, so you have quite a few 
if you end up anywhere close to that point, kind of like one nearest neighbor, you are going to do badly. So basically, you'll have something like twice near uh, twice Bayes' error, which is blood analysis for one nearest neighbor. But if you have something like that in high dimension, then something interesting happens because this thing becomes a pyramid, and you're looking at the volume of this pyramid, which is below this line. Now, a pyramid, assuming your noise level is low, you will not have too many of this, right? So you will have like once in a while, you'll have like one of these pyramids. Now, a pyramid scales as two to the D. So instead of having some sort of fixed proportion here, you will have one over two to the D points, which are misclassified. So instead of having the optimal error, you will have one plus one over two to the D. Now, if this is D is 10, well, you have... 0.1%, right? This is extremely close to the optimal. So in high dimension, if this is doing what it is doing, which is, I'm not sure, but something like that, then you would actually get a much better performance potentially than you would get in low dimension. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure what happens when you have a lot of classes and why. But this is kind of a two... So if your number of classes is small, I think it will be exactly the same as this. If your number of classes is large, I am... Yeah, why? Why is a discrete space? So, but if the number of classes is why, it's, it's unclear. But if the number of classes is kind of fixed, like small number, like 10, it's probably very similar to this. Yeah. It's unclear, it's unclear, yeah. I, 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 I'm I, not sure. I think for one nearest neighbor classifier, you can prove that the number of classes somehow doesn't matter, at least in some limit. For this one, I'm not sure. So I see what you are saying. I think I'm trying to get at something orthogonal to this and maybe a different idea. So uh, when you try to fit, say, 50 points with a million degree polynomial, uh, I want to say that, sure, there exist million degree polynomials that fit all of these and do a really bad job, but somehow maybe there are a large number which don't do a bad job. Yeah, so if you think about kernels, actually, you can see there are infinitely many kernel functions which interpolate your points, right? Because it's an infinite dimensional space. Any function can be approximated by a kernel function. It's dense in the space of functions. So it's exactly what you're saying. There are infinitely many functions which fit your data exactly. But what you find is not just any function. Actually, if you look at that solution that I wrote before, it's a minimum norm solution. That solution has rather special properties. And something about that properties make it look like this. Certainly, there are many functions which look like crazily oscillatory and all sorts of other things, but you don't find them. And um, interestingly enough, for neural network, it seems that the gradient descent itself... Uh, so, okay, for linear regression, you can prove that if you start gradient descent at zero, you always find the solution of minimum norm. You're converging to solution. So, if you so imagine I'm doing linear regression and my number of variables is more than the number of solutions, uh, the number of constraints. Then, in principle, I can there is an infinite space of solutions. It's a linear subspace. In principle, I can converge to any of them. But if you start at zero, you actually converge to the solution with the minimum norm, and. It seems that for things like, for kernels, it's exactly that. But for neural networks, it seems that something like that is happening. That solution that you actually find in, by your, doing your stochastic gradient descent is very special. And, but we don't understand the properties. Like, what, what about that solution makes it good? Because yeah, a priori, it can be anything. So, yeah, I, I think this is a very... Very good point. It's a two-layer neural network with a fixed first layer. So you can view it as a... So another way to think about kernels is to think about feature map into some infinite dimensional space and then linear fit there. So it's a two-layer neural network, but the first layer is not learned. It's fixed. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, so it's actually x goes to k, I don't know if you can see, x goes to k x dot. This is a functional space, this is an element of a functional space. So this is my feature map. I map it to this infinite dimensional space and then I'm doing linear feeder. Yeah, you can also view it this way. Uh, <laughs> but it's the same as that one, actually. It's the same, yeah. Yeah. The adult third, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's... So, yeah, and uh, Surya, for example, gave a nice talk yesterday in particular about that, that aspect. But the question is, so we know that there are functions which cannot be approximated, but we don't know uh, if, well, approximated using a small number of other things, but we don't know anything about learnability. So we don't have any result saying that there are functions which are not learnable in one class, but learnable in another class. Um, as an expression, those functions are dense, so any function can be represented by a curl. You know, it's a tricky question because in, first, by this algorithm, you never get more exact, you, you never have your number of um, the complexity of the network is also equal, always equal to the number of examples that you have. Now you can say, well, how many examples do I need to learn a function? Well, it's a tricky question because think about just having, imagine I just give you one highly oscillatory function. I, this is sine and x, so let me call it tx, okay? Now I don't tell you t. Suppose t is equal to one million. Okay, well, how many examples do you need to learn something like that? Well, it's some function of t, which is not very nice if t is large. You cannot learn it very efficiently if you have few examples, and, you know, from maybe t or something. So even one function is very diff can be very difficult to learn. I tell you exactly, okay, it's just a sign tx, right? This is a really simple function space in one dimension. It's really difficult to learn because it looks like noise if you don't have enough examples. So, okay, it has a short representation. Okay, this is the representation. It's super short, mathematically super simple, but learning it is extremely difficult if you don't have a lot of examples. So it's not clear that the fact that something is representable directly corresponds to learnability. And you, you can prove actually the VC dimension of the things is infinite if you don't put any bound on T. So, um, um, so I think learnability need to come in. If if we, if we just care about approximation, then sure, fine. But if we actually care about learnability, I think we have to uh, see what can be learned because there are certainly classes which can which have simple expression with deep networks, but whether they're learnable is not clear at all. Or learnable in some interesting way. Well, I don't know if it's the same, but it's not clear that learnability is better, right? You also it's a question of, oh, okay, a real function in some sense, what fits better, which is another decline of very unclear, right? What's, what's real world functions? What do they look like? Yeah, so expressivity is a mathematical statement, but it's not um, directly related to the sample complexity. Well, I think if you don't use um, if you, you don't use convolutional features of some form, you cannot do very well on complicated images. So that's very clear. So I feel that um, probably there is it's 
So I think if you just use fully connected networks, I don't think there are any examples. I, I don't know of any examples like that. But with convolutional features, uh, clearly you have to you have to use something like that. Now the question is, well, how much learning from data plays into the success of this convolutional thing? So they use deep. Um, they use uh, this kind of deep representation as convolutions, and plus they use some sort of fully connected layers on top of that often. So the fully connected layers can be replaced by kernels. People have tried it, and they do get good results. However, that's kind of cheating, because you're using these representations which learn from data in any case. So just replacing those layers with the fully connected layers with kernels is not enough. You somehow have to get rid of um, to, to say something like that, you would have to get rid of the training. Uh, I don't know. I think what can be done almost, I believe this is, can be done, if that you can probably train them on images using only unlabeled data without any supervised learning, and then use the kernel method on top of that, and then you probably can get very good results. So in that sense, maybe supervised deep learning is not necessary, but you can probably you probably still need to do some sort of unsupervised deep learning to train those convolutional features. That is less clear because I think they have not they have not yet shown that they could batch those. So may, maybe maybe the kind of Stefan Malas type of thing. Yeah. So, so that would be very interesting of this, but it's less clear that. I, I don't think they have a result showing that their features are. Uh, MNIST is special because we can get very good performance even using a Gaussian kernel on pixels. So I, I wouldn't. MNIST, I think, is very nice to sort of test your ideas. But when you actually talk about images, MNIST is too special. Maybe, but yeah, I, I, I think I think you would I think to really be convincing you have to get a result on say something like ImageNet, which may not be like as good as the state of like current state of that because that changes every week, but at least sort of in the right ballpark. I think you know even even like some like SVHN or whatever that called CIFAR like one of those maybe is okay. But I think I MNIST mean, is just too special. Maybe, yeah, no, maybe. maybe. I, I'm not, uh, I mean, it certainly would be very interesting because if, if that is right, then we can just probably use a kernel on top of those features. Maybe that help. I'm I'm worried that it would not help for something like a Gaussian kernel because you have basically kind of a constant decay. As you get more data, you're converging to something which is quickly decaying, and as you have more and more eigenvalues, your average condition number would probably so it would help a little bit, I'm sure, but may it will probably not solve the issue because you you have a tail which looks like this. So you have a few large ones, and then you have a lot, lot of stuff. And as, as you get more data, you're seeing more and more stuff there. It would still go to zero, just a little slower. Than, uh, because somehow it converges to the actual kernel operator, and the operator itself has some sort of exponential decay. Yeah, if you look at Laplace kernel, it's a little slower, but it's still, it always goes to zero because it's a compact operator. So you always, so infinite, condi I think infinite conditional number is some sort of unavoidable thing. We just have to be, we have to do basically the same analysis, but uh, in subspaces. So for the, for the quadratic loss, it's very nice because you can do it one eigenvector at a time. But in more general cases, I think we can probably still do some sort of subspaces, but it's Tricky. It's not. Uh... 
Yeah, I, I mean, certainly we see that acceleration helps, so square root is better than, uh, I mean, certainly square root is better than the original, but it's somehow, if you just plug it in the bound, it doesn't tell you anything. It's, uh, yeah. So maybe let's uh, oh, okay. thank the speaker again, and um, <laughs> we have... Um, <coughs>